So let me begin by, by framing the work that, that I'm going to talk about um, today and, and to try to situate that with some other and complementary approaches that, that you may know to thinking about um, efficiency and sustainability in, in library operations. Our, our goal here is really to make sure the preservation programs are healthy and, and we need a, a, a framework and a plan for how we're going to do that. Uh, this is um, real work that's been going on for a little while now. Um, I arrived here in 2017 um, when the library was starting a new strategic plan. Um, and, and during the first couple of years here, we did um, our first uh, major um, cost study of, of preservation programs uh, and did some organizational self-study um, with, with the, the chiefs, uh, supervisors, and some of our key subject matter experts um, to, to determine for ourselves if we felt like the, the organization was in a healthy place. Um, over the next uh, couple of years, 2019 to 21, um, we engaged in a, a major reorganization effort for the Preservation Directorate, um, and we started a process that we call budget rebalancing, um, which is not asking for new appropriations or, or new funds uh, from Congress and, um, and, and from you, um, but looking at the resources we had available to them and seeing if we could reallocate them in ways that would have a, a better impact. Uh, we've done the first round of that now um, and have uh, completed a, a second major cost study of our, our big service areas, um, are starting to frame up the, the subsequent studies and, and, and develop some cost frameworks that we can use um, to, to effectively run this preservation program. Um, and, and from that, we've come up with some key questions for thinking about preservation strategy that, that help us really put things um, into action. Uh, and I want to, for, for those of you who are, are coming to to this talk um, with a background in preservation administration. I, I want to contrast that or, or, or compare at least um, to some other approaches. Um, so, for example, um, Helen Shenton's work in life cycle collections management that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that really looked at broad library issues, um, making the correct interventions at the correct times. That certainly can be preservation, uh, but can also include cataloging to improve metadata and, and accessibility, um, thinking about future costs that ought to be managed certainly a preservation issue, but also a facilities and capital issue, thinking about reorganization um, for the way activities happen um, uh, all through their life cycle. Uh, and, and those are good instructive categories uh, for us, but to administer the preservation program, we, we found that we had to get a lot more specific. Um, and, and so I'm going to take you today through some examples of how we dug into some of these questions, how to draw boundaries around a particular preservation strategy, determine if they're suited to the current needs of the library, understand what they cost, work out if there are more cost-effective ways to go about them, and look at the, the staffing plan, the actual capabilities um, that, that we need to evolve with the needs of the library. Uh, so, so today we'll be in, in, in this, um, this, this side of the slide, so to speak. Um, I'll begin with just a little overview um, to tell you about the mission and work of the directorate, introduce the problems that are, are guiding my thinking on this, um, and then we'll get into some work um, in, in these big categories, uh, how, to, how to understand boundaries and suitability, how to think about cost and cost effectiveness, uh, and, and then to take you into our organizational structure uh, and, and the staffing plan that we're developing to do that. Uh, some of you, I hope, are familiar with this, uh, the Library of Congress's mission statement uh, to engage, inspire, and inform Congress and the American people with a universal and enduring source of knowledge and creativity. Um, like any preservation program, we draw out specifics um, from that to, to talk about how we'll um, go about achieving that mission. Um, and two of them are pretty obvious. Um, enduring, I, I hope, um, make, makes a lot of sense for a preservation program. Uh, but we also think a lot about universal, um, which to me says something about the, the, the style and hopefully the substance of the preservation program we're, we're developing here, something that can be attentive to all or at least a, a really diverse set of the, the formats, the types of resources, and, and the ways those materials might be used. That approach, um, drawing things down from the mission, is necessary, but it's still not sufficient to the task of preservation administration. Um, to, to really run a program, we have to start from those foundations um, and make sure that we are building up to something that, that meets the mission of the, the need of the library. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is how we actually test that and, and turn that into act, practical work that we can do. We do, in fact, a lot of work. Um, uh, so there are plenty of reasons to think that the preservation program is functioning. Um, uh, unfortunately, when we look at just countable numbers and, and things that are, are easy to count, um, it's really 
easy to lose um, important aspects of the, the preservation program. Um, so if we set a performance goal, uh, something like um, complete 6 million preservation actions in a year, um, it would be possible to meet that goal um, without doing a single conservation treatment, with doing no scientific research, uh, without even running an emergency response program. Um, and, and, and any preservation directorate at the Library of Congress that was uh, not engaged in those activities really would not be a healthy um, uh, program. In fact, I think all of you would tell me uh, that, was, that was an abject failure. Uh, and so counting alone is not going to get us there. Um, and so this brings us really to the problem that, that we're confronting in preservation administration. Uh, preservation is broadly accepted as a worthy um, and, and mission critical um, area for libraries writ large. Um, despite uh, all that goodwill and good intention, um, it's also really easy for a preservation program to fall outside the mechanisms that make an organization function. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that we have to solve problems that are ultimately measured in decades or centuries. And we have to do that in libraries that operate in annual funding cycles and generally in five-year strategic cycles. So sustainability and, and, and a healthy program requires us to develop activities that can continue into eternity, but will also show regular benefits in the present. Uh, one way I frame this to my, my chiefs um, is, is that we have to be careful because any expenditure we can dream up, and we can dream up some incredible expenditures uh, here at the library, uh, if we divide them by forever, uh, they start to look pretty small, uh, but they also lack urgency. Um, it's very easy um, to, to say um, we've got a century to deal with this problem and move on to the next one. Uh, at a certain point also that can seem irresponsible. Um, uh, even dividing a program into 100 years, 50 years, 30 years, um, it takes, uh, it can start to seem like a, an amount of money and a length of time that don't call for action and, and are not seriously intended. Um, and so when we think about criteria for a solution, uh, we're looking for measurable elements that are meaningful in the present and also build toward long-term success. Um, and, and so we've started to evolve the way we talk about preservation. Um, and, and many of you, I'm sure, um, are familiar with language like this. You'll still see it a lot from the Library of Congress, and I'll still say it a lot if you ask me what preservation does um, just sitting down next to me in the seat in the airplane or, or buttonholing me in the elevator. But what we're trying to say more and more, um, or to recognize more and more, is that that can come across as saying, um, in a long, ambiguous time, things will still exist. Um, and we don't know what people will do with them. Uh, and we're trying to evolve our language um, so that we say something more like, in a meaningful time, we'll have similar or improved options for the use of this resource um, compared to the present. Uh, and we're trying to zoom in a, a little bit from preservation and access to preservation and usability. Um, and, and I think that focus on usability helps us uh, have a, a more concrete uh, and, and also more diverse conversation about the options and, and, and ways people can use um, collections. Uh, people uh, for, with all sorts of different backgrounds can use collections in all sorts of different ways and want different things for them. And preservation can be the answer to how they, how they get those. To do that, to really put it into practice, we have to start. Um, and uh, even that aspiration of usability of the collections um, in the present is still a little bit backwards for really running a program. That, that sort of thing gets me out of bed and gets me excited about um, the work I'm doing, um, but it's not sufficient to really running a preservation program. Um, and so one of the first things we've found we have to do is draw boundaries around um, uh, preservation strategies. Um, so uh, trying out different assessment methods um, is an important way to clarify that. So that might mean looking at cost and quantities of a work unit, uh, an approach that um, can be effective for uh, processes like library binding, uh, reformatting, transfer to storage, where it's um, effective and meaningful to count that an item has left one storage area and moved to another. Um, and it's meaningful to ask questions uh, about whether we can do more or improve quality for the same or less cost. Uh, Another way that we can clarify boundaries is asking about capability or adaptability. Um, so for example, for conservation, for scientific research, for emergency response, uh, one thing we can ask is whether we're over or underspending to maintain a sufficient level of capability. Uh, so for example, in scientific research, 
we may identify a certain range of formats that we feel the library needs to have substantial expertise around. Um, paper comes to mind, uh, but perhaps a better example is Iron Gall Inc., an area where the library's had a really rich, robust research program uh, and continues to, uh, and it has to have that program because of the scope of that media in its collection. Uh, and, and so it's possible to ask if we're spending enough to maintain our capabilities in that area. Uh, it's also possible to ask if we've overspent in capability in a certain area. Uh, and we do this from time to time uh, deliberately. Uh, we did a wonderful project called Glass at Risk uh, with uh, partners um, from uh, the academic uh, from academic institutions uh, and with funding from the NEH, a major investment in glass over a number of years that yielded some really important results for the library. Uh, and glass is an important media for us um, for photographic collections, uh, in our case, because we have a substantial collection of flutes and musical instruments. Uh, but when we get to the question of whether we would continue to have expertise in glass as a core component of the library going onwards, um, we would assess that differently than paper or iron gall ink. Um, and, and so finding the right boundaries, what you're trying to measure and how you're trying to measure it is, is critical to really having a sustainable program. This also helps us get out of some classic preservation administration dilemmas. Uh, some activities are simple costs. Um, cost per phase of digitization is simple to measure. Uh, others can be very uh, complicated. Uh, a conservation treatment, a scientific research enterprise have lots of variables that, that evolve over time. Uh, and, and one of the traps we see ourselves stumbling into again and again is treating as simple um, activities that are actually complex or complicated. Um, uh, I refer my group to this um, Kinnison framework um, a lot uh, to, um, to make sure that we're thinking intelligently about the type of problem we're trying to solve um, and whether we're going about it in the right way. Uh, a complex or, or complicated issue like conservation treatment um, may require some, some probing or, or, or sensing. Um, we may do some uh, initial experiments and, and analysis of materials to help determine what type of treatment will be effective. Um, we may need to uh, do some tests um, either on that item or on reference samples to determine how they're going to respond to a certain treatment. And only after we've made our way through that um, process of of probing, sensing, responding, um, and, and developing our, our model for how we'll do a treatment, do we actually get to defining the steps that we're going to take on, on, on an item? And it's important to understand that um, there are multiple categories that can still have some structure uh, and, and, and measurability to them. The other question we, we ask in trying to understand um, our preservation framework is suitability. Um, uh, so, for example, our current strategic plan includes a digital strategy um, and preparing materials for digitization at scale is a really necessary competence for preservation. Uh, our visitor experience master plan increases the amount of exhibition space. Uh, because of this, the library hired its first object conservator um, and we started improving processes to test for fade testing or to partner with um, uh, the, the right expertise and, and right um, uh, technical firms to develop um, exhibition cases and determine if the materials and design of those uh, were going to be effective. Uh, youth and non-scholarly audience outreach has been a, uh, a focus of the current librarian. Uh, so we launched a blog, we developed workshops for kids to learn basic bookmaking, uh, and we adapted heritage science um, to develop classroom lesson plans and try that out um, uh, with, with uh, uh, we've had some, I think, some eighth grade classes through recently um, and have been working with some of the Einstein education fellows at the library to, to think about how we can use um, our knowledge, our capabilities to reach a different audience. So in all of those things, we are making sure that the preservation program is suitable, that is it's suited to the current needs of the library. Um, preparing materials at scale required us to think about assessment methods um, and to develop protocols for transmitting um, uh, care and handling instructions. We had to add some core comp uh, some sort of core capability to our, our conservation program. Um, uh, and, and we launched a blog, something that actually will be useful in any strategic environment. And, and that test was important to us in thinking about sustainability. Uh, we had a reason to launch a blog. We had a reason to engage in, in developing um, some new curriculum materials. But we were getting, in the present tense, something that could have value in the future. We needed an objects conservator to sustain a larger exhibition program, but we've increased the core capability of conservation. We needed to develop methods of assessment and
but now we have new tools and, and new frameworks available for us that we can apply to different projects in the future. And, and that, to me, is the beginning of sustainability. Um, uh, it's anchored in the present, and we at least see the next step in its, its potential development. Having done all that, we still need to figure out what things cost and whether we're running them efficiently. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we've found that this discussion of boundaries and suitability is really important to that. Um, often costs are much easier to start with. Um, you can look at payroll data, you can look at contract data, you can look at supplies orders and, and see some numbers. Um, in the cost studies we've done, uh, we often have started there because it, it's, uh, those are data we can get to. Uh, we are never able to complete our analysis without coming back to this conversation about boundaries and suitability. So, uh, so I, I, I really conceptually um, think it's important to recognize that costs um, uh, come after understanding the, the ways that you're going to measure and, and ways you're going to assess things. Um, one of the things we found in doing cost studies um, were that many commercial business concepts and metrics could be used effectively in the library environment. Um, and so we talked about um, known and hidden costs of production and operation. We talked about minimum viable cost of operations or staffing. Uh, we talked about opportunity costs. We talked about costs over time or the present value of money. Um, and, and although all of those metrics were useful, what, what mattered was that we had our librarians, uh, our conservators, our subject matter experts in the room with the consultants we brought in from the um, with, with a business background to apply those metrics to the right problem. Uh, and, and one of the, I think, important lessons from our efforts in trying to more effectively measure and administer the program uh, was not that private sector or commercial metrics are inapplicable to libraries or not-for-profits, uh, but that they are often applied to the wrong parts of an operation or they are misapplied to a particular area. And, and again, this discussion of boundaries and suitability really matters here um, to help focus the right metric on uh, the right metric, the right measure on the right process. Uh, this helped us solve some things that have uh, for a long time been preservation cost puzzles or things that have certainly frustrated me at, at, at other points um, in, in career. Um, so for example, conservation or scientific research, we started to look at that not as the cost per treatment, um, but to look at the cost of providing the capability. Um, and, and that is a has been a much more effective way to start thinking about how we develop those programs and determine the right size, and determine when they need to grow and the types of investments we're going to make. Um, asking whether uh, the Scientific Enterprise Library of Congress published three articles or six articles per year and determining a cost per article uh, doesn't actually tell us much determining where the Library of Congress needs to have expertise, where it needs to be making permanent investments and temporary investments, um, and determining the, the, the amount of resources we want to bring that whole suite of capabilities to bear starts to be a really meaningful um, preservation administration um, uh, project. Likewise with conservation, something I, I, looking at the participant list, I know some of you reckon with, um, a conservation treatment um, may take 15 minutes, it may take 15 hours, um, and, and so cost per hour is, is not necessarily an effective way to measure that, um, but measuring the, the, the necessary capacity to present exhibitions, um, sustain use in the reading rooms, uh, to maintain all the, the different types of formats that matter to an institution, the cost of providing that capability can be a measurable and meaningful way to assess. So this is, is changing to um, from what it would cost us to do that treatment or to conduct that research to, to asking if we're spending the right amount to achieve the outcomes that depend on research. That Jay, also helps. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think your connection may be a little unstable. Do you want to try turning off your video? I will do that, yes. Yeah. I'll do that as soon as I find the right screen. <laughs> Thanks, Amelia. Um, and uh, we'll, I'm looking at my clock and my slide count, and I think we'll have um, plenty of time to go back for questions and clarifications as well. Um, understanding total cost is part of the package, but, but cost effectiveness uh, matters um, as, as well. And, and so one of the things we have um, recognized is it's it's rare in preservation to have direct like-for-like -like alternatives where I can, um, 
either do this treatment or that treatment, where I can use this strategy or that strategy. Um, and so comparison often means a discussion about the way we want to plan our risks um, and, and the types of opportunity costs. Uh, binding a book, uh, flat paper, uh, doing reformatting, uh, a different array of, of um, options or providers, the, the item itself and, and the use case tells you what you're going to do, when um, and, and how you're going to do those things. Um, the other uh, issue that, that we run into here um, is that even if we get more cost effective in, in libraries, that um, may not yield direct saving, right? So it's not that we just get the money back in our pocket to do it as we please, um, but it may give us more or better options within the same total program cost. And, and I said up front, we've talked about this um, project as uh, rebalancing, um, and, and it's for this reason that, that it's been a way for us to look at what we want to attain um, and rather than simply ask for money, um, uh, to look at whether we can stage the way we spend money um, and plan the way we spend money to achieve more with, with the same amount. Another problem we, we encounter here and something that I, I would note um, for all of you, depending on how your institutions are organized, uh, is there may be cost savings available to preservation that actually accrue to external parties. Um, for us, energy reduction has been an example. We've done a lot um, and, and are engaged in some major projects to reduce the energy usage of um, all of our facilities and operations. Um, that energy budget actually for us lives in the architect of the capital budget. Um, and and uh, one lesson here is be good friends with your colleagues on campus um, or, or throughout the interagency. Um, but the other is to recognize um, that this is a discussion that, that's important to have with leadership at your organization. Um, which cost savings do you pursuing uh, cost savings that are going to um, accrue to the campus, working with the library to make sure that they are gaining the most benefit from that um, and, and having an above the board conversation about what the library is doing that's a broader benefit um, is a really important, um, I think, piece of political savvy um, for, for us in preservation where there are systemic changes that, that we can sometimes um, um, help be a part of, uh, especially around energy savings um, and, and sustainable operations. Uh, I remind you now of slide 14 uh, that uh, no surprise time has to be a factor in thinking about preservation. Uh, and one of the things that we have paid attention to are time horizons that are meaningful. Um, and, and we've landed on this rough set of, um, of, of planning timelines um, that we are learning um, are effective to think, to think about in preservation. Um, a lot of the work that, that I do um, I try to think in about a three-year cycle. Um, that's the length of one or two annual budget cycles. Um, it's comfortably within the strategic planning cycles that, that organizations do. It's also in scope for staff performance plans. It's meaningful to have a conversation with someone about what they want to have done over the next two or three years. Um, it's meaningful to think about what someone will do during the first couple of years after you hire them, uh, uh, to think about what they want to do between um, now and, and uh, a couple of years from now. And even as people start to approach retirement, um, many people do not know date certain um, when they intend to retire, but they begin thinking about in a few years, I'd like to retire. And so it's possible to have meaningful conversations about legacy. And I think that third point, um, uh, certainly in, in my office, budget cycles and strategic planning cycles matter a lot, but in terms of a library actually achieving something and in terms of a program really being effective, Nothing happens without people. And, and so thinking about ways that all of this thinking about um, program management and effectiveness can um, come down to, to earth and, and really be meaningful, you have to think about the way it's going to work for people who have real lives to plan um, and, and real careers to manage. And so this near-term sort of three-year cycle um, has become, uh, in, in my opinion, a very important part of that. It's also useful, I, I find, for preservation to think about a sort of medium term. And, and I, I say 11 years um, uh, for, for this um, because one of the promises I like to make um, is that the preservation program will provide every option to uh, each incoming librarian um, that, that 
as, as the librarian before started with. Uh, so with the librarians now on a 10 year term, um, being able to think that Dr. Hayden's successor um, will have all the options for how to use the collection that she had on day one is a meaningful and, and, um, and, and actionable promise that I can make as a preservation director. Um, and, and I suspect if you look at your own organizations, you'll see similar timelines as well, whether that's a, a, a university librarian, a, a president of a historical society, um, it still anchors the, the work that preservation is doing uh, to, the, to the people who are going to be responsible for and engaged in that. It comfortably consists of a couple, two or three year near-term effects. Um, and it can also align to really major career phases. If we think about 30, 40, 50 year careers, it's possible to think of having a couple major arcs like this um, that, that people can, can work in. Um, and it's possible to also think about some um, uh, bigger, if not hairy and audacious goals on, on, on that timeline to think about uh, as a bottom line measure of success, I think about maintaining all of the ways to use the collection now as um, uh, from, from now to, to 10 years from now. Um, it's also possible to think about some major changes I would like to make. Um, in 10 years, uh, could I have the entire collection under better inventory control? Can I make a substantial change in storage that might require a capital construction project um, or, or major funding? That medium term across two strategic planning cycles I, I think is really important. It's um, for preservation a way to start projecting into forever um, and projecting into the centuries that we're responsible for, um, but anchoring it to real things that organizations think about and, and care about. We also think on a slightly longer term um, uh, in terms of a 40 year cycle. And, and for us, there have been two real key indicators for that. One is it's the depreciation cycle for a capital facility. Um, if you can solve the preservation storage challenge, you solve a lot of other preservation challenges. And so these facility projects have been very important for us. And, and especially when we think about sustainability, the, the amount of time in which we might measure the payoff from an investment in more sustainable operations can be on this kind of cycle. Um, it's also a person's career. Um, and so it's meaningful to think about um, from day one uh, to 40 years in the future, uh, is there a systemic change you want to make? Is there a problem you do not want to leave to the next generation? Or is there an opportunity you want to open up for them? Um, let me give you a, a, a real example of how that works um, by, by looking at some actual um, uh, costs that we've developed. Um, uh, so in, in this example, um, uh, these are these data are derived from actual cost studies we did, and I'm not going to get into the specific um, uh, programs that are that are involved here. But I want to see you how, show you how this pattern plays out over time, um, because year one, two, or three, um, strategy one in the blue and uh, strategy uh, two in the yellow, uh, which is really sort of a, a do it now and defer uh, a second part to later approach. Um, the first strategy looks uh, twice as expensive. Um, as we get into 10 years and kind of cross into that medium time frame, uh, the second strategy is, is, is twice as expensive. By the time we hit 20 years, halfway through that long arc, um, it's actually three times less expensive to take that, that first strategy. Um, and, and that's a pattern we saw a number of times where there was some upfront cost to start doing work a different way acquire a piece of machinery, build a building, um, invest in a, a, a lab or, or a space. Um, and that upfront cost can be hard to bear and, and can really look like a justification for, for partial or, or alternate strategies. Um, and, and this being able to project in time um, is really critical to understanding whether um, uh, an investment is worthwhile. Uh, we've seen this play out a number of times um, we're looking at it um, uh, often with, with all our strategies to understand also when we may make, need to make new systemic investments, um, especially if it's something where we, we might anticipate needing to make a major capital reinvestment, uh, putting a new roof on our storage module, for example, so that we can prepare the institution for that um, and have a financial picture for them that lets them understand that one-time investment and, and the, the return that they're uh, going to achieve on it. Once we've drawn all these boundaries um, and, uh, and, and, and done all these studies to look for this, um, it's still important to understand how we're going to make those matter to the actual people who do the work. Uh, I've been here at the Library of Congress about five years. 
Um, there were a few surprises during the last five years um, uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I want to show you um, it by talking about how we managed reorganization to see how to show you how these cycles kind of play out in practice. Um, one of the key questions I, I have for us is whether we have the staffing plan that has the right capability and diversity of staff to keep evolving with, with the needs of the library. Uh, and when I got here in 17, um, we were bringing a new division into preservation. Um, about We almost doubled the size of the directorate um, by bringing in the collections management division. Um, and I had a sense that would be a stress on the organization. Um, uh, I also did not know what changes would be useful. And, and so we did um, a couple of years of self-study. Um, we ran some cross-divisional teams um, to get staff working with each other and start to give me a sense of um, problems that, that we might be able to, to work at with reorganization. Um, I did some 360 degree reviews to understand um, from around the organization what people thought of um, me and what, what was going on. Um, and we also did, of course, the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, which formed, informed us a lot about how much people felt engaged in their work, felt like they had a voice in it, and, and how much they, they trusted leadership and were, were ready to, um, to, to, to work with us and try new things. Um, our assumption was that we would do that for a couple of years, have a reorg proposal throughout that. We would run more teams, um, continue you know, with these um, measures, uh, and then we'd be comfortable into a next strategic planning cycle. Um, a few things changed um, from, from 17. Um, COVID changed some of what we could do um, effectively. Um, uh, we had to um, do some of the individual pieces of this on radically different timelines, both shorter and longer. But because we had approached this with, with a thought of um, multi-year cycles or, or, or manageable steps we needed to take in the near term, um, rather than strict annual um, milestones to hit, we were able to adapt pretty flexibly. Um, and, and in fact, we've come out of that um, uh, process reorganized um, um, and, and in a much better position for strategic planning uh, and able to think really meaningfully about um, the first strategic plan um, that, that I was engaged in in 17, um, I, I have a much better sense from my um, divisions of, of what matters to them for 23. And I think we're starting to have a lot of confidence that uh, over that medium term arc, um, we'll be in a really healthy place in fiscal 28 when presumably uh, a third strategic plan comes in. Um, and, and so this, this approach to thinking in, in cycle um, has, I think, helped us really roll through um, some, some tremendous surprises um, in a healthy way. One of the things that came out of that organizational work um, and some of the goals we, we developed to that was to think really carefully about autonomy and interconnection between divisions. Um, we wanted to also think about options for career development succession. Um, and we wanted to separate mission from methods. Um, so um, to reduce jobs that are just process only or depend on a particular contractor service. As we wanted people to be a, a resource for the library that could be applied to many different library um, activities and not feel locked into just doing um, a particular thing or, or a particular function. Uh, so as we did that, we, we came out with a, a slightly leaner um, uh, structure, four divisions instead of five, uh, collections management with broad oversight for the um, inventory control, storage management, logistics, um, and, and, and assessment and collection improvement. Um, conservation, uh, uh, slightly enlarged to bring our general collections conservation together with all the other uh, conservation activities with broad support for physical materials, their treatment, the environmental support, um, and, and assessment of them, uh, emergency response and research and technical developments and methods. Uh, preservation services to give ourselves a, a division that really was strongly aligned with managing some of the really large-scale contract services we depend on at the library, all of the information systems that inevitably go with those services, um, and to give us a sort of um, uh, office within the directorate that would help us with um, assessment, project development, and, um, and, and uh, sort of all of the business functions that are necessary at this scale, um, and a research and test that got um, some more structure um, uh, so that we could really clearly look at the range of functions we have to provide from quality assurance and standards to, to fundamental research um, and, and to analytic services to support conservation um, and, and research with the collection. Um, here's what that organization chart looks like um, uh, and, and our current management team. 
um, with our, our, our four chiefs. Um, you've heard from several of them this week. Um, and but more important um, is is this um, that it, it let us think about a staffing plan um, that has career ladders. Um, so many of our our positions in government speak were single grade, a GS nine or a GS eight, um, and gradually we're putting all of those onto ladders. So a GS nine that can ladder up to a GS twelve as they um, develop expertise, as we need to add responsibilities, um, and as they move through their career. Um, and, and so that's um, starting to help us put um, people on more sustainable career arcs, uh, and it's also starting us uh, starting to help us um, recruit for people who are going to look to develop in careers. Um, and, uh, and and so those laddered positions and the positions that um, at least leave a, a door open for people to build a long-term career at the library um, is really important to us in in sustaining the directorate. Um, and one of the really satisfying things to see over the last five years is that we've moved from a, a long tail where we had um, a, a large group of staff close to retirement um, and a large group of staff um, uh, who we were hiring and very little in between to a much more linear curve of people who are at different career uh, phases um, and, and a much more even um, uh, pattern across all of our staffing as we stand people up in ladders and they stay longer rather than moving quickly to, to a, a new position when we don't have uh, opportunities for them. Um, so with that, we're, we're, we're at the end um, uh, and I wanna just do you know, a quick review um, uh, before we go into Q&A. Um, uh, you know, the, the outcome of all of this, I think that we are thinking uh, much more clearly, and we are thinking about much more specific things um, that help us um, manage the preservation directorate here. One of those is understanding who cares about the work uh, in the present, um, uh, so that if uh, the, the question is, um, who cares if we do this thing, um, being able to really put a name to that, a stakeholder, uh, an institution that we have a partnership with, um, so that we, we know that the work we do matters um, every day. Um, and thinking about usability of collections, not just access to the collections. Uh, and, and I think that usability is a much more compelling concept um, uh, because it invites us to ask questions about who will use something um, or uh, if something is useful to uh, multiple different audiences. Um, it asks, lets us ask how and why something will be used or to what purpose someone is going to use something. Um, and it lets us ask when and where something is going to be used, which helps us think about which format or, or service ask those questions, I think it's much easier to shift preservation from uh, the, the, the so-called fix-it shop, whose job is, is to repair or stabilize broken stuff, um, to a really proactive part of the library, one that, that is uh, essential to the library's mission and, and fulfills a role for youth, the sort of affordances and, and ways collections can be used. And by doing that, helps the library really make good on its diversity goals of connecting to more users and, and to more use cases. And, and I think that shift from preservation and access to preservation as usability um, has helped me a much more robust perspective about where we can be adding, uh, adding value to the library and providing um, a service that matters to people in the present and gives us a good foundation to build towards the future. Uh, so as we do that, we think about these boundaries that we can draw around preservation strategies and whether those strategies are suited to the needs of the library. Um, that lets us be a little smarter about thinking about what the total cost of that strategy is, um, what goes into it, how does it play out over time, um, and then asking the, the question um, of whether there's a more cost-effective way to address that goal rather than just looking to pinch pennies from day one um, to, to understand the context we're, we're doing that in. Um, and, and all of that has really helped us, I, I think, have a much more um, humane and uh, sustainable staffing plan that um, uh, is, is really more suited to the way people um, build their careers and build their lives, um, and, and, and hopefully is going to mean that we have a really robust preservation directorate here um, at the Library of Congress for a long time to come. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to open the floor to questions, um, and, and uh, Amelia, maybe if you'd like to talk people through um, how uh, we uh, want, want to manage Q&A here um, on the webinar. Yeah, so if you could all enter your questions into the Q&A box at either that bottom or top um, toolbar, that would be appreciated. We do have a few that have already come in. 
Namely, uh, there were some requests to view some slides again. So if you could start by showing slides seven and 10 again, that would be great. I think that's within my power. Um, or you could have me do it if that's easier. And I can... <laughs> no, no, no. Let me just um, uh, exit out and um, uh, back up in my, my, my slideshow here. Um, While so he's looking have... for those, um, just a reminder, uh, all of these presentation recordings ha uh, that happened this week will be posted on our website. I'm putting that link into the chat right now. Uh, the Library of Congress does process these videos, it adds closed captioning and some Library of Congress title slides, and that process usually takes at least a month, usually more. Um, so, sorry, and thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, all right, let me put um, that back up. Uh, so here is, um, I hope, uh, Nope. <laughs> I can do I, that. I, and then yeah, um, okay. we'll you, move you, on to. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the mission and some of the, the key info. Um, uh, th those are things we can also um, uh, direct you to um, on our, our website and, uh, uh, and, and relevant blog posts as well. OK, so while I'm getting that up, we have a question from someone asking, uh, could you speak a little more about your use of outcomes in planning and evaluating preservation projects? Yeah. Um, there's a lot more to the question, but we'll start with that part. Yeah, okay. So so let me just give a little brief context from, from the more about the question. You know, one of the things um, that especially grant making agencies um, and, and federal grant making agencies particularly ask about um, it's sort of income, uh, income uh, in, impact or, or outcome um, uh, based measurement um, for grants. So, so they're really asking um, not what are you going to do, um, but how will we know that something is different after you have done it. Um, uh, this for preservation is, is where I think the notion of, of usability really comes into its own. Um, so for example, um, if, if the library had a goal could start asking some questions about how the collections needed to be handled um, to achieve that. Um, uh, one we're looking at right now is um, STEM support, right? So um, we're fortunate to have a, a, a really robust um, scientific um, uh, division at the, the Library of Congress. Um, and one of the things we can do with the collections is derive um, reference sample that data. You saw some of that in um, the, the talk on Monday. Um, and so that's a, a use of the collection that, that we can open up. And so we can think about an outcome where, for example, um, uh, that could be attached to uh, an exhibition, it could be attached to a particular format, but we could say, you know, we want an outcome here um, that is um, users will be able to interact with these collections. Um, uh, they will support, um, uh, for example, um, scientific curricula at the, um, uh, grade eight through 12, kind of high school level. Um, and, and we would like to see an outcome where, uh, you know, there's a certain rate of adoption for these, or we would like to see that student success in science changes when we provide them with lesson plans that include heritage science. Um, and, and so doing that helps us start to um, step backwards from what, what would we like to do? Well, we would like to do um, infrared spectroscopy, or we'd like to do x-ray fluorescence tests. Um, and, and to start thinking about what is the change that, that is going to affect, what, what, are, what do those techniques and, and activities support. Um, uh, a more kind of classic library example um, is that uh, we, would, uh, we would like to um, improve and, and increase the amount of interlibrary loan rates. We, we see ourselves as a collection of last resort for the nation. Um, and, and so we want to be able to sustain interlibrary lending. Um, we have roughly 30 million books in the general collection um, and we have some inventory improvement work we have to have do um, and unless something is in inventory um, we we can't send it out um, on interlibrary loan so we could think about an uh, inventory improvement project that that we might measure in terms of its outcome on interlibrary loan so fewer requests rejected 
or more requests completed um, more expeditiously. And that might guide us to think if, if our goal is really to improve ILL success rates or, or turn time, uh, it behooves us in preservation not to just start inventory work at A and go to Z, uh, but to go to interlibrary loan and say, what subject areas are people asking about? Um, and, and can we identify the areas in the collection where an inventory project is going to yield an outcome, a, a positive um, effect in terms of um, uh, uh, fulfilling interlibrary loan? We might also back that up by looking at condition issues in that area, right? And, and could we measure the number of times we reject a, an interlibrary loan by condition, um, if we really want to improve that, um, just trying to fix everything in the collection won't get us there. We have to understand how the collection is going to be used and by whom. All right, so I, I hope that, um, that that helps give a sense of that. Um, outcome is exactly the right word to be using as a concept uh, to get to. Uh, and I think that's why we found that kind of stepping through those, that series of questions about boundaries and suitability before we get to cost and cost effectiveness um, really matters quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm trying to make sure if you answer the second part of this question as well. I think their concern was mainly about outcome metrics for long term projects and also kind of how that relates to the IMLS requirements. Yeah, I, 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 I think that this is another area where having um, some meaningful time horizon um, is, is useful. Um, Thinking about you know improving interlibrary loan outcomes or um, reducing the number of times that condition is an obstacle um, to a, a request in the reading room. Uh, if you want to show payoff on that in two or three years, um, uh, it's going to be really important to work with the, the, the departments that understand what parts of the collection are being used and who is using them. Um, it's also really important that you be able to go to your institution and, and, and not promise year one, um, which, which really may be unattainable, but instead of that, to have a meaningful process that, that, um, that can happen in real time in front of the institution. And I think that roughly three-year cycle is important for that. Um, I think the way to get to sustainability often is to find those near-term projects that, that pan out over a couple of years uh, and understand the larger medium-term goal that they can get to. So I might at the Library of Congress say, um, I want the not on shelf rate um, to go down by a certain percent or I want to cut it in half. It may realistically take 11 years to do that. Um, and so the challenge that I see for myself and, and for my chiefs um, in that environment is to think about the little two or three year steps that are going to move us towards that. Um, what are the collections where we, we know we can make a difference um, during that two or three years where we're starting here? Um, can we start thinking about the boundaries and, and, and defining the problem for, for the next arc? Um, and, and I think for, for us, that's where um, we're beginning to be able to connect um, some big aspirations um, to actual practical projects we can do. Um, it's important to understand what you're measuring, right? That um, one measure we might make is whether we have a capability. Another then is what we would do with that capability. Uh, a really nice example um, from someone who I was speaking to at the very beginning when we were doing tech support um, uh, was developing a better um, stacks assessment method. Um, we want to be able to get a heartbeat from the collection about their condition. We spent two or three years developing a method um, to, to do SAC survey at the Library of Congress. That method will now go into production and we'll be able to measure it on an annual uh, basis and it will have output. Um, but the first thing to, to measure was not um, how much is it costing us to develop the method, it's do we have the capability and is it worth investing in the, the time and, and effort to develop that capability, to buy the equipment, to build the databases, to um, train the people to do to do the work of developing the method, and so we're measured. We measured it one way at, in when we were developing the capability. We'll probably start to measure it a different way as we start to apply that capability to um, uh, to um, to library problems and kind of put it into operation. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about the ladder laddering yep. positions. Um, so when you redevelop positions to have ladders, what was the time frame on position description process to create those? Yeah, uh, again, that's why the near term matters, right? It, it takes roughly three years um, to get a position built, classified, funded, posted, 
fulfilled um, and, and in action. Right? So we're we're seeing right now um, the first positions um, uh, that we built ladders for have gone through classification, um, and we've begun to to do hiring into some of them. Um, and uh, that um, part of that is for for you know we have 150 odd people on here for the 20 or 30 of you who are in the federal uh, system. That's the federal system um, uh, and, um, and and navigating across continuing resolutions and, and complicated federal um, kind of budget issues. Um, but but that's something that we can do in in the near term, but that we can't um, necessarily deliver in a particular annual cycle because of the variables uh, of that annual cycle. Um, I see there's a question there, um, uh, you know, also about sort of the, the ladder from um, GS five to, to eight, which are our technician positions, and GS nine to 11, which um, tend to have an additional kind of education requirement um, uh, and are sort of our specialist positions. That's a problem where we're gonna have to crack a little differently. Um, uh, so there are certain ways that we can ladder people up um, in career progression um, through uh, a, a series in the library. There are also certain points at which we have to look at um, where different educational background is required and, and what we, we are and are not allowed to and are and are not able to do, um, both as a federal agency and, and just as any organization with certain resources. Um, my real hope there is, is um, not that we solve the problem. I, I don't know that it is a Library of Congress problem to solve, um, but that we can be very clear with staff um, so that they understand um, how far uh, the latter should take them directly uh, at which times and in which ways they may need to pursue additional education or training, um, and, and and that around that um, we make a graceful handoff so that the institution can provide things like schedule flexibility, um, help people plan the leave accruals they need, provide the sort of um, internship and professional growth opportunities that may go hand in hand with development, um, even if we we can't sort of just uh, send someone out to to get a degree, which is a, a much uh, kind of higher higher um, level of requirement for government. Uh, but a good example of this is um, uh, conservators have to complete a pre-program uh, internship and a, an end of program residency on, on the course to completing their master's degree. Uh, and so one of the things we really try to protect and, and grow in the, the library are those internship and residency op options so that if someone is trying to pursue a career in conservation, um, that, that we can build um, certain pieces of the scaffolding that, that the institution can provide and, and so that there's a clear understanding of uh, what's available and, and how to how to manage that process. Um, you know, and programs we've done um, internally, like um, uh, career development program and, um, and, and detail programs are part of that. Um, and other programs like our, our HBCU um, partnership that gets rising um, juniors and seniors in college in for a summer internship so that they have a roadmap into cultural heritage careers before it's time to apply to graduate school rather than, than after they're partway through that are, are all parts of kind of making sure that there is a um, both a, a, the career ladders we can provide in government, but also just a general sense of, of kind of career progressions that are available to people. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we just have one more question left. Um, can you speak to the ways in which you have approached tiering collections or using collection curation in preservation plans? And what roles or departments are involved in that decision making? Yeah. Um, we have a, a couple different ways um, we do this. Uh, so so we, we have at the library what we call a metal moniker system. Um, gold, silver, bronze, copper, platinum um, uh, for, for collections. Um, and, and some of that has to do with market value, but, but a lot more of that has to do with um, uh, uniqueness, distinctiveness, and institutional alignment. Um, so, so things that are sort of um, fundamental to supporting the work of Congress uh, for us get a, a certain level of attention. Um, uh, we, we understand the resources that Congress needs most and that the Congressional Research Service and, and, and others use. Um, and, and so making sure that those collections are in inventory and ready to go. Um, rises to the top, even though they're they're bronze in terms of, of um, kind of market value at, at times. 
Uh, likewise, things that are, are really distinctive in defining the culture of the United States uh, of America and, um, and, and, and the territories uh, uh, and, and, and people that make that up um, receive a, a certain um, level of attention. Uh, uh, we also look at intellectual, um, control, uh, intellectual property, right? So um, materials that we can make available freely in the public domain um, kind of rise um, in, in our, our planning for um, uh, digitization especially. Uh, uh, so we, we have looked at um, the collection development policies and kind of collection management policies of the library that talk about the subject areas we collect, the formats we collect, um, uh, and, and, and try to align those then with the work that the library is doing in the present. And, and this is really where the, the broad kind of policy turns into, into practice is making sure that every custodial division, every curatorial division of the, the library has liaisons in the preservation um, directorate so that they can say this year and sometimes next week, um, here's something that has to happen. Um, and, and, and that is really where preservation happens is one-to-one is, is -one, um, from the people who are responsible um, for uh, interpreting and delivering the collections um, to the preservation uh, division to make sure the collections are ready for that use. Uh, so we, we have a, a broad institutional is that we also have um, uh, um, a framework that is um, connected to actual people um, who are, are empowered to go have a conversation about what needs to happen. Um, I did you. Uh... I can't tell. I'm sorry if you ended the answer or if your sound cut out. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> end of answer. <laughs> okay. Um, though, with that said, I have I have a, a few minutes if um, if, if there are others. Um, if but let me let me also say um, thank you all for attending at the top of the hour. And I know we're at the, the formal um, end of this. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, happy to to pursue. Um, I'll be hanging around ALA if you'd like to talk live in person. Um, and, and of course, um, ask.lock.gov or, or follow up with me directly. Um, uh, this, this, this is allegedly what I think about all day. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So um, really appreciate you all tuning in today. I uh, hope you have a great, uh, a great day ahead and a nice weekend to come. Yep, thank you all.